Andrea and Ivy ask you to close your eyes and form an image of a corporate farmer. A corporate farmer with a board of directors who has shares and receives dividends. A corporate farmer that owns a large 10,000 acre ranch with thousands of head of cattle. A corporate farmer that runs the business based on the numbers and who sells her products into a food production network and doesn't sell their product at farmers markets. She then asks you to open your eyes and look at her, a mother in her 30s who, along with her husband and in-laws, runs their corporate ranch. The shareholders are her family. In other words, they operate a business that has a succession plan, and that succession plan is to pass on ownership to her children. And she says they're not alone. They are not outliers in agriculture. More than 95% of farms of consequence in Canada are family-owned and operated businesses. She is a strong and proud rancher who's also worried that Canadians are being told she is to be feared, not to be trusted, feared, that she doesn't care for the land or the animals that she raises, that she's only in it for the money. She says, look at me, is that what you see? Adrian Ivey says the images that others are using to promote their products at the expense of people like her and her family are wrong. So she's decided to stand up and in the words of Paul Harvey say, tell the rest of the story. I invited blogger, speaker, and one of the voices of ranching in Saskatchewan, Adrian Ivey, to join me for a frank conversation that matters food for thought episode about cattle ranching. Adrian Ivey, welcome to this segment of Conversations That Matter Food for Thought. I saw your TED Talk and went, wow, are you ever an extraordinary storyteller? Because you're taking what is the current narrative that's out there about farming and how it's being controlled by uh, corporate farms, and you're saying, okay, what do you think a corporate farm actually looks like? And I love the way that you say to people, does that image that you have uh, mirror what you're seeing on stage right now because you are a corporate farmer? So what makes you a corporate farmer? Because you look to me like you're somebody who, well, you could be anybody anywhere. Like you don't look like a corporate farmer to me. Yeah, absolutely. So I think first and foremost, I do think of myself as just a regular everyday person. I am a mom that has a messy house and some unruly kids. And we just spend every day of our lives like all other normal people just trying to get by and live day to day. So when people think of corporate farms, they think big and bad and scary, when the reality is that corporate farming is really just, um, it's a way of providing a succession plan to our for our farms so that we can someday hopefully pass them down to our children. Um, it's a, a way of managing our taxes and really just our business structure. So the idea of being incorporated isn't scary at all once you kind of glimpse behind the curtain. But a lot of people today don't get that opportunity to see the people like myself and my husband and my kids that are just going out and farming every day of our lives. Well, uh, when you use the word corporate farm, we think of somebody who is, uh, well, faceless. They're impersonal. They're inside some glass tower and that they don't really have a connection to the land or to the animals that are providing new nutrition for all of us. And yet you're saying that that would represent a, a very, very small portion of any uh, farming in Canada. Uh, so you're not alone, in other words. Not at all. In Canada, I think the number is something like 97 or 98 percent of Canadian farms are family farms and a big chunk of them also happen to be incorporated. And then from coast to coast, there is an entire spectrum of different sizes of farms. Um, some very, very small, only an acre or two, and some really big 
hundreds of thousands of acres and a whole lot in the middle. Uh, we have to be on the fairly large side. We are tens of 10,000 acres and, and you know over a thousand mama cows, which is really exciting for us, but it really hasn't changed from when my husband and I first started out, we were much smaller, um, you know, had 100 acres instead of 10,000 acres and 50 cows instead of 1,000 cows. But really the mentality of farming, no matter the size, is the same. It is a love of the land, a love of animals if you're a livestock farmer like us. Um, it's really, really interesting speaking with farmers from across Canada from different sizes of farms and really seeing how much we are the same even though our operations and our farms are so different. So you have 10,000 acres, you have a thousand head of cattle. Uh, and in your TED talk, you say you don't go down to the farmer's market and sell directly to mom and pop. You sell into a food processing system. And these are descriptions that a number of people have started to go, Whoa, well, how, how do I know that I can trust you, that you're uh, providing me the best possible nutrition and that you actually care for the animals. How do you start to convey to somebody that uh, you actually care tremendously about the land and the animals that you care for? I think the biggest thing is just uh, for both sides, for myself and for farmers like me, and also for um, consumers and the people purchasing the food, the first step is just having a conversation. And uh, for people like me being open and honest and transparent about what life on the farm really looks like, and that when things are unknown, they can seem very scary. But once you get to know people like me, it's really not scary at all. We take just as good, if not even better care of our cattle now than when we were very small farmers. Um, some of that is just experience. The longer we do it, the better we get at it, like most things in life. Um, but there has definitely never been a point in our farming path and uh, adventure along the way that we have ever had to sacrifice our love of the land or the animals in order to grow as a farm. So I get, because I'm now developing this series about food, I get people asking me a whole bunch of questions, especially about cattle, and I'm gonna admit that I my, my knowledge is limited. And somebody goes, oh yeah, well, what about a feedlot? And I have to go, uh, I don't exactly know what a feedlot is. What is a feedlot? Right. So a feedlot is basically like the apartment complex of humans for cattle, right? It is a more concentrated feeding system that really allows beef production to be as efficient as possible. Now, it's really important to remember that when we're talking about beef production in Canada, Almost all of our beef spends a lot of time out grazing in pastures, the beautiful picturesque idea that comes to mind for all of us when we think about uh, cattle out thriving in the natural setting, which is wonderful. That is a huge part of our farm here in Saskatchewan. But there's also the feedlot side, which is different, but really great in other ways. It is a way for us to be a little more, um, not more, but in a different way, environmentally friendly. It's a little bit like, um, I don't know how to uh, describe this really accurately, uh, but it's just a way of being able to use less land, less water and less time in order to get the beef into onto people's plates and uh, really have a more balanced approach to beef. Okay, so help me understand this. Like people go, oh, well, if I have grass-fed beef, that's going to be different than if I have mm -hmm. uh, feedlot-fed beef. But of the couple of cattle ranches that I've been to uh, for this series, I see cattle, as you pointed out, roaming around in the grasslands all over the place, and I'm thinking, well, uh, okay, would you call these grass-fed cattle? And the, and the answer comes back quite honestly, well, yes, but no, not completely. And, and so it's, it's, it's my understanding, and help me understand this uh, properly, 
that you know cattle are out there grazing until they're getting ready to go to market and that's when you bring them into the feedlot is is that right that is very correct so let me give you a bit of a glimpse into what happens on our farm so that maybe you can uh, picture it a little bit better so on our farm our mama cows like i said we've got about a thousand mama cows that they will calve every spring so we'll have about a thousand babies uh, baby calves with their with the mama cows for the summer in the winter once they are ready to be separated for their from their moms because uh, they're pregnant again and they need to be focusing on the next stage so they'll go into our feedlot our own feedlot for just a couple months and it's really just a chance for them to uh, get used to being alone and within their own herd of, of calves their own age they will go back out onto grass that next summer so in other pastures we'll have herds of just yearling cattle is what we call them and then for the last two to three months before they're ready for processing that's when they will go into a feedlot and they will be fed um, feed rations very nutritionally balanced feed rations that are really high in uh, grain often to make that time as short and efficient as possible and so that when they are the animals are ready for harvesting and processing they are as um, tender and flavorful as what we've all come to expect from Canadian beef. So what do you feed them? Because it's my understanding that the uh, grains and uh, barley that you may feed them is not uh, a food that is grown for human consumption, that is grown specifically for cattle. Is that correct? And what's the difference? That is an excellent question. So depending where in Canada animals or livestock are being fed, they'll be fed some different things. Um, cattle are the ultimate upcyclers because they often take a lot of grain that maybe was grown for human consumption, but then something happened along the way. Maybe it got rained on and maybe it didn't get harvested at the right time. Um, but somehow, for some reason, it, is, it isn't fit for human consumption. Then that grain will go to a feedlot. Cattle will make excellent use of it and turn it from something inedible for, for humans into high quality protein that we get to enjoy as steak. So uh, the grain component is a big part of rations. And then always there will be a grass or a forage component as well. Um, animals that are, whether they're in the feedlot or they're being fed out in the field on pasture, it's really interesting. We work directly, all farmers work directly with animal nutritionists. And I swear they have a better diet than I do or my kids do. Everything is uh, really managed to keep them very nutritionally balanced so that they stay healthy. A topic that comes up around health is the use of antibiotics. Um, and, you know, when do you use antibiotics? Why do you use antibiotics? And, you know, what do you do to ensure that when that animal is uh, ready for, uh, to go into processing, uh, that they're not uh, carrying traces of those antibiotics? That is an excellent question. And that's something that I probably get asked more than anything. The idea of antibiotics in our food chain sounds really scary. And hey, as a parent, I get that. The idea of that sounds scary to me too. Uh, what's really, really important, first of all, is that we understand that antibiotics in and of themselves are not a bad thing. Uh, I've talked about as a parent, if my kids get sick, if they have strep throat or an ear infection, the responsible thing for me to do is uh, give them antibiotics under a doctor's guidance. And it's very much the same with our livestock. When animals get sick, we are going to give them the appropriate medication as recommended by our veterinarians. And that veterinarian farmer relationship is very, very important and something that we all take a lot of responsibility in maintaining that relationship. Um, when it comes to actually entering the food chain, it's there are 
an enormous amount of rules and regulations around antibiotics and every individual medication has its own withdrawal period. So that is the length of time that once you have given an animal a treatment of that medication, it cannot enter the food chain for a certain amount of time. And it might be, depending on the medication, it might be days, it might be weeks, it might be longer. So that is where as farmers, a huge part of our job is record keeping and making sure that we have written down easily accessible records of when each animal was treated and make sure that it is um, processed accordingly. I really appreciate the fact that you're sort of going bang, 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 uh, answering my questions because it's hard to find somebody who actually knows the truth about some of these things. Okay, ear tags. Uh, one of the things I've heard about ear tags is, for one thing, they have unique identifier uh, numbers on those tags so that you can track that animal. It's my understanding that when you have dairy cows, those ear tags do not uh, contain hormones, but when you have uh, like cattle for uh, beef, that you do have uh, a hormone in, in, in contained in that ear tag. Do I have that right? I am so excited to have this conversation with you because you are not very right. Oh, come on, <laughs> I thought I knew. <laughs> Okay. So um, there's a bit there's a big difference between ear tags and hormone implants, oh. and you are you are very right in a way that they both involve ears. Yeah, <laughs> they both go in in the cattle's ear cattle ears, uh, and that is for a very good reason that I'll talk about in a second. But for the most part, ear tags are just used as a way of identifying cattle. And there are ones that just have a number written on them for visual identification. And then there are um, electronic ones that you can scan that stay with the animal right through processing and harvesting at processing facilities. Um, and that's more of a food safety and traceability um, mm -hmm type of an ear tag. And then completely unrelated, there are hormone implants. And I can oh. totally understand why you would get the two confused because they both go in the ear. The reason that hormone implants only go into cattle's ears is because it's the only part of the animal that is guaranteed to never ever be used for human consumption. And uh, oh. the thing with hormone implants is that they aren't a dangly tag or or a button that you can visually see from the outside of the ear what it is is a very tiny pellet um think like a tic tac if you know what i mean a little minty tic tac but it's a little metal pellet and it goes just under the skin of the ear and it provides slow release hormones that help cattle be really effective efficient at gaining weight. Um, what I like it to compare it to in people is there are some people or different stages of our lives as people that sometimes we put on weight a little bit better than others. <laughs> <laughs> right, me too. I am someone who puts on weight a little easier than a lot of other people. And as beef producers, our job is to produce beef and use as little resources as we have to. So less feed, less water, less land, less time. It's really important that we are producing beef efficiently. And you're not using steroids. So yeah, hormones and steroids are the same thing. One is just an artificial version of, of, of the other. You know, there's oh. natural and artificial hormones and steroids. Uh, but they're all very similar to what's already occurring in our bodies. Um, we're not introducing any kind of hormones or steroids that aren't already involved in within the beef system or, you know, within an animal's body and, and uh uh, hormone system. Uh, I think hormones are a really fat thing. We think of hormones as mammals and as people, but there's hormones in everything. Um, there is more estrogen in a 
serving of cabbage than there is in a serving of beef often. So um, hormones are in all living things, whether they are animals or plants, and not something to be scary, but definitely something to be uh, understood scientifically. I think that is the biggest thing in Canada is that we really have a strong regulatory system and so many rules around food production that need to be followed. And that's a really good thing because in the end, it protects the people like you and myself who are eating the food that we're producing. So the Canadian Centre for Food Integrity released a, a report last year saying that there's a growing, that fully one third of Canadians aren't so sure about the sustainability and the integrity of the system. And there's a growing portion of people who are starting to question this. And they're, and they're saying, okay, who do I trust? Now they do say that they trust farmers and you're one of them. From your perspective, is there anything in this food system? And I know that you, are, that you have a self-interest here, but is there anything that you say, oh, okay, we could do better or, or, or what, um, or do you feel completely comfortable that the processes that we've developed are, uh, are strong and continue to move in the right direction? I think that when it comes to food production in Canada, there is not a single industry or uh, food type that can't do better. I think that agriculture like all things in life are continually improving and as farmers it is something that really drives us every single day in find new ways uh, learn new techniques and new methods and new tools and uh, i think that myself on our own farm we want to do better every single day and year after year after year and i think that that is a pretty common theme throughout all of agriculture so i would say when it comes to looking for better ways there is no part of agriculture that it doesn't need to do that we all need to, we all want to I'm really looking forward to see what food production looks like in 20 and 50 and 100 years from now. Um, I, it's just so exciting to me to see how much better we get all the time at, at producing food. So is quality beef uh, uh, production in Canada sustainable? Absolutely. I have not only seen it on our own farm, but having toured farms from coast to coast, there are some pretty fantastic things happening. And I, as a bit of a um, land steward myself, I feel very comfortable about the sustainability of Canadian beef production. Well, Adrian Ivey, uh, I wish you all the best with your farm and your ranch, uh, but I also wish you the best in continuing to share the messages about the work that uh, the women and men who are in agriculture in Canada are doing because everything that I can see, it's quite a remarkable story. Thank you, Stuart, and thank you for this conversation. It's been fantastic.